This is lesson number 36 in the book of Judges. Open your Bibles to chapter 20 and look at verse number 38. That's where we, where we will begin in just a moment. Now to catch up where we left off in the story. It was the third campaign that the nation of Israel had against the Benjamites there at Gibeah. All of the tribe of Benjamin was in the town of Gibeah. They had 36,700 soldiers there that were fighting, but all their families, their wives, their daughters, everything, everyone was there in the town of Gibeah. The nation of Israel was there. They were fighting against them on the first campaign and on the second campaign, the first day and the second day, Benjamin beat the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel lost 40,000 men. But on the night of the second campaign where they, uh, where they lost the men, they, they prayed and they offered offerings, a burnt offering and a peace offering to the Lord, and the Lord answered them properly and said, you, I will deliver them to you tomorrow. The reason why he did that is because, I believe, because they petitioned him correctly. The night before, and even before the campaign, before the first campaign and the night of the first campaign, when they wept after they lost 22,000 men, they did not petition the Lord correctly. But after they had lost 40,000, they petitioned him correctly. And so they come back out, they go out on the, on the third day, they look like to the Benjamites that everything is the same, so the Benjamites keep the same strategy, but the Israelites change theirs, have the men in ambush behind, they go into battle, the Benjamites come out, 27,700 Benjamites come out of the city of, of uh, Gibeah, they rush out, they begin to fight, 30, 30 men of Israel are lost and killed, and Israel begins to retreat just as they planned. And they retreated and they retreated so that all 26,700 men of Benjamin were far enough away, from, enough away from the city of Gibeah that they could not turn and retreat very fast. And with that, a signal comes, and down from the ambush from, the, from behind, the 10,000 men come in and they destroy everything that is in Gibeah, and they begin to burn it. And they kill every man, woman, boy, and girl that is left in Gibeah. And the soldiers are going to see it and they're going to retreat. And that's how Israel made this happen. How did Benjamin, as I left you last week, how did Israel draw Benjamin to follow the soldiers out of Gibeah? We find that. I've kind of told you about it already in verse number 38. Now the appointed sign between the men of Israel and the men in ambush was that they would make a great cloud of smoke rise from the city. Then the men of Israel turned in the battle, and Benjamin began to strike and kill about 30 men of Israel. For they said, Surely they are defeated before us, as in the first battle. So here Samuel tells us again about the 30 men. This is not about 30 more. This is the same 30 that has already been told to us. And upon their death, Israel retreats. It is the second time the writer is telling us to make circling through this story to tell us this. This time through the story, he's telling it from Benjamin's perspective. Benjamin thought it would be, they would be victorious for the third time. They even said, surely they, have def they are defeated before us as in the first battle. But that would not be the case. It was not the promise of the Lord. But then... Benjamin saw the burning of Gibeah behind them in verse number 40, chapter 20. But when the cloud began to rise from the city in a column of smoke, Benjamin looked behind them, and behold, the whole city was going up in smoke to heaven. Then the men of Israel turned, and the men of Benjamin were terrified, for they saw that disaster was close to them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel towards the direction of the wilderness, but the battle overtook them while those who came out of the cities destroyed them in the midst of them. They surrounded Benjamin, pursued them without rest, and trod them down opposite Gideah toward the east. Thus, 18,000 men of Benjamin fell. All of these were valiant warriors. The rest turned and fled toward the wilderness of the rock of Rimon, but they caught 5,000 of them on the highway and overtook them at Gidom and killed 2,000 of them. So all of Benjamin who fell that day were 25,000 men who drew the sword. All of these were valiant warriors. When the soldiers saw the burning of the city, they stopped fighting and they began to run. They were terrified. What do we do? We take, take care of our family? What? They didn't know what to do. They became combobulated uh, in a way. Israel chased and killed on that campaign, add those numbers up, 
25,000 men. Now back in verse 35, we are told that they, told, they killed uh, 25,100 Benjamites were killed. May I say this, I inter interpret both to be right, but both are rounded numbers. As in the case of the 18,000, the 5,000, and 2,000 mentioned in this passage, those numbers are just too sterile. All through this, this story, it seems that the writer is giving us a rounded number. Therefore, the 25,100 that were killed in verse 35 is rounded to the 25,000 in verse 46. All is well. Now, reading on, we learn that the third battle, they had fugitives. Verse number 47. But 600 men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimon, and they remained at the rock of Rimon four months. The men of Israel then turned back against the sons of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, both the entire city and the cattle and all they found. They also set on fire all the cities which they found. 600 Benjamite fugitive soldiers hid for four months at the rock of Rimon. They were found, but they were not killed. But when we do the math, we are still missing a thousand Benjamite men that we don't know where they are. Maybe the rounding got involved. Where are they? Some scholars say they were killed in the first two days, but we do not have any information to tell us that, that that's true. Some say that they were included in the rounding of the numbers, but nothing tells us that that is true. So we don't know. It seems best to just take it for what it is. 600 soldiers got away and hid at the Rock of Rimmon. Four months later, Israel is going to release them from there. And the, uh, another 1,000 soldiers somehow got away or were never caught, were never killed, or were just rounded numbers. That scenario seems most plausible at this point in the story. Now moving into chapter 21, our last chapter in the book of Judges. The fighting with the tribe of Benjamin continued on after, the, after they uh, killed the 25,000. They went back and they totally destroyed every Benjamite, every man, woman, boy, and girl in the tribal area of Benjamin. Everyone, those who were in Gibeah and all throughout the rest of the country. That's what it just told us. So here in chapter 21, the fight may be over, but the details are not. So in this section of the book, we have, is, we have seen the nation's defiance, we have seen the nation's disobedience, and now we have seen the nation's defense, and now we come to the nation's determination. Sin has consequences for those who are left to pick up the pieces. And even the tribe of Benjamin was defeated. The relatives of the soldiers of Benjamin would suffer more than just the loss of the soldiers in arms. Furthermore, the nation needed to account for those who helped and for those who did not help with the punishment of Benjamin. So there are consequences. We come to the nation's determination and the tribal vow that was made. Chapter number 21 and verse number 1. Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, None of us shall give his daughter to Benjamin in marriage. Well, that's new news. Since coming out of Egypt, the male sons of Israel could have married any female of any of the twelve tribes, and the offspring of the marriage would become a descendant of the father of the tribe that he was a member of. However, now, after this, as this battle begins, they made a vow before that no daughters of the 11 tribes would ever allow their daughters to marry a Benjamite. That meant that there had to be enough Benjamite daughters to marry the Benjamite sons who needed wives. Whether or not this vow was made in haste or not, it did not matter. The vow was made, and the tribe had the vow had to be kept because keeping a vow was in accordance with the law. Now remember Moses said it was better not to make a vow than to make one and not keep it. That law resulted in the tragic story that we've already read about in the book of Judges where Jephthah made a vow that anything that came, the first thing that came out of his house after the victory, he would put to death. And that resulted in the death of his daughter. The vow had to be kept. 
Now with the knowledge that the vow was made by the tribes, you would think that all was well, but it's not. Even though the Benjamites were guilty of grave sins, the rest of the tribes still wept for the sinfulness of Benjamin's tribe. We should take that as a lesson. We should all weep for the guilty and the evil. They will get their due punishment in the Lord's time. It was true even with Benjamin. The tribes of the nation gathered back at Bethel with the tribal question, verse number 2. So the people came to Bethel and they sat there before God until evening and lifted up their voices and wept bitterly. They said, Why, O Lord, God of Israel, has this come about in Israel so that one tribe should be missing today in Israel? More than 40,000 men of these 11 tribes were dead. More than 25,000 men of the tribes of Benjamin were dead. But why were the tribes at Bethel weeping? What were they weeping about? Not for the loss of their dead, but for the loss of an entire tribe. For the first time since coming out of Egypt, the tribe was not participating in worship and weeping as a combined nation before the Lord. Not one Benjamite was at Bethel. Why did this happen this way? One tribe was missing. Just to mention it, notice that fasting was not part of this time with the Lord. Enough said. Still at Bethel, we come to the tribal worship. Verse number 4. It came about the next day that the people arose early and built an altar there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. As always, the burnt offering was for their own sins. The peace offerings were to thank the Lord for all that He had done even while they were guilty of sin. This worship happened on the morning after the gathering at Bethel. Notice one more thing. For the last time I'll say it in the book of Judges. Fasting was not a part of worship. But after the time of worship, then came a tribal inquiry of the missing men. Who among the tribes of Israel did not come to fight against Benjamin? Verse number 5. Then the sons of Israel said, Who is there among the tribes of Israel who did not come up in the assembly to the Lord? For they had taken a great oath concerning him who did not come up to the Lord at Mitzvah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. Hmm. Well, more happened at Mitzvah than the writer told us in the first time around. This second time around, he's telling us more. He got the vow that they're, going to, uh, uh, they're not going to give the daughters. That was new. Now we've got this vow that at Mitzvah, Israel heard the testimony of the Levite who sent that body, those body parts with his, uh, his concubine around to the tribes. And the men vowed several things. And first, to bring judgment on Benjamin. Second, to not let their any of their daughters marry Benjamite men. And now third, to put to death any of the tribe of Israel who did not join them to fight in battle against Benjamin. Get this. Even if one person from every town or whatever came to fight, the whole town was saved from this vow. But we will learn in verse number 8. We're going to learn about that. But for now, we're in verse number 6. Here the sons of Israel are weeping because of the missing wives for the remaining men of Benjamin who had not reached the fighting age, who had lost their wives. Verse number 6, And the sons of Israel were sorry for their brother Benjamin and said, One tribe is caught off from Israel today. What shall we do for wives for those who are left, since we have sworn by the Lord not to give them any of our daughters in marriage? I want you to notice that even though Benjamin was not represented at Bethel, the rest of the tribes were still concerned about the future generations of Benjamin. Without wives, how would they, the tribe recoup its num numbers with the births of children? The question will be answered, but not yet. Another problem is still at hand. Now Samuel goes back. 
the tally had been taken. The members of one city of Israel did not adhere to the summons of Israel to meet at Mizpah. The tribal punishment had to be exerted. The destruction of Jebesh Gilead was necessary. Here is the story I told you about a while ago in verse number 8. And they said, What one is there of the tribe of Israel who did not come up to the Lord at Mizpah? And behold, no one had come up to the camp from Jebesh Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were numbered, behold, not one of the inhabitants of Jebesh Gilead was there. And the congregation sent 12,000 of the valiant warriors there and commanded them, saying, Go and strike the inhabitants of Jebesh Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the little ones. This is the thing which you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every man and every woman who has lain with a man. As we said before, if only one person from Jebesh Gilead had come to Mitzvah, all the inhabitants of Jebesh Gilead would have been spared, but not one came. The vow had to be completed, and 12,000 soldiers of the city were sent to kill every person, every man, every woman who had not lain with a man. This is instruction that we have here is difficult to understand as to why it was done, but it is clear. Every man, every woman, every boy and girl were to be killed except virgin women or virgin girls who had not reached the age of which they could be married but were at that age now. We are not clear how young that would have been, but it might have been as young as 11 or 12. The destruction of Jebus Gilead occurred. The salvation of the virgin women who were saved for Benjamin's new wives occurred. How many virgin girls were saved for Benjamin from Jebus Gilead? And they found among the inhabitants, in verse number 12, and they found among the inhabitants of Jebus Gilead 400 young virgins who had not known a man by lying with him. And they brought them to the camp at Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. The men were sent from Bethel to attack Jebesh Gilead, but they took the virgin girls back to Shiloh. Why? And why did the writer say, Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan? Shiloh was not in the tribal area of Benjamin, as was Bethel. Shiloh was just up the road between Bethel in Benjamin and Shechem, which is in Ephraim. Shiloh is in Ephraim. Now we find out in verse number 19 that a festival of Israel was soon to be held in Shiloh. Therefore, while the troops were at Jebesh Gilead on the east side of the Jordan River, the rest of the tribes would move from Bethel just a short distance to Shiloh for the festival. And the troops from Jewish Gilead with the 400 virgin women would return there and meet them there. Why the white writer states that Shiloh was in Canaan, we really do not know. But there are two logical answers. First, another Shiloh must have existed somewhere near. One that has been lost to all knowledge except that of the Lord through this time period. Second, more likely... Over the past 300 or so years, the area around Shiloh had been repopulated by the Canaanites. It was their land to begin with. It was their land before Israel took it. We are not talking about the whole of the promised land. It was just indeed, in, and it was indeed inhabited by Canaanite descendants. The whole promised land was Canaan land, and it was in total Canaanites. However, by the time Joshua marched into Canaan land and got there, to take the promised land. Some of the descendants of Canaan had become strong with their own families and their tribes, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Gershians, and the, Canaan, and the original Canaanite group, that they had plotted off the land and, had, and divided up the Canaan land for themselves. Each new name represented a strong descendant offshoot of the original Canaanite tribe. However, they were all Canaanites. But the original Canaanite group still controlled two areas when Joshua took the promised land. They controlled a strip of land next to the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea, and they controlled a strip of land next to the Jordan River. Shiloh sat in that strip of land at the Canaanite land 
next to the Jordan River. The nation of Israel never fulfilled the command of the Lord to destroy every Canaanite in the, in the Promised Land totally. Earlier in the book of Judges, it identified all the tribes that did not remove the Canaanites from their land, and Manasseh and Ephraim were the worst. We find that in chapter 1, verse 19 of the book of Judges. Shiloh was in the tribal area of Ephraim, but undoubtedly, the Canaanite descendants who lived in the area given to Ephraim had reestablished themselves around Shiloh over the 300 years of the six cycles of sin recorded in this book of Judges. Now, the writer is probably telling us that Shiloh is in Canaan because of the Canaanite population that lived in the surrounding area of Shiloh. But at Shiloh, I want to tell you, the eleven nations made peace with Benjamin, and the virgin women were given to Benjamin. We see that in verse number 13. Then the whole congregation sent word and spoke to the sons of Benjamin who were at the rock of Rimon and proclaimed peace to them. Benjamin returned at that time, and they gave them the women whom they had kept alive from the women of Jebesh Gilead. Yet they were not enough for them. And the people were sorry for Benjamin because the Lord had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. The rock of Rimmon was where the fugitives from the battle were hiding for four months. 600 men. There was also 1,000 men who we don't know what happened with. But four months had passed, and the nation of Israel stationed at Shiloh sent word to these men at Rimon and released them with a word and a promise and a peace treaty between the tribes. The men at Rimon, as well as the men of the tribe of Benjamin, joined the other tribes back at Shiloh, where the virgin women of Jebesh Gilead were given to the Benjamite men who needed wives because their wives had died in the battle. Because all the rest, I'm, what I'm saying to you is we've got 600 that we know of and put our eyes on of the tribe of Benjamin and all the rest of the tribe of Benjamin are dead. Men, women, boys, and girls. So women from Jebesh Gilead are being given to these 600 men, but there's only 400 virgins, but there's 600 men. So Israel is short on virgin women to give to these men. What are they going to do to make up the difference? Because they're not going to break their vow. Verse number 16. Then the elders of the congregation said, What shall we do for wives to those who are left, since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? They said, There must be an inheritance for the survivors of Benjamin, so that a tribe will not be blotted out from Israel. But we cannot give them wives of our daughters. For the sons of Israel had sworn, saying, Cursed is he who gives a wife to Benjamin. As mentioned before, Every family in the tribe of Benjamin had gathered in the town of Benjamin, the towns of Benjamin, to be protected as they fight against those 11 tribes. But when the ambush came, when Gibeah was destroyed, all the families of the entire nation, uh, entire tribe, uh, they came back and they destroyed every man, woman, boy, and girl. And the tribe of Benjamin had not grown and increased to the number that we thought it would have. And they were not successful, and only 600 men were left of the entire tribe of Benjamin who were hiding at Ramon. That's all that was left. We do not know about that extra 1,000. Maybe they had already died. 600 were left. But it may be that as, as it may. 600 Benjamites arrived at Shiloh for wives, but only 400 virgin, virgins, virgin women were there. Israel was short 200 women. Still true to their vow, Israel would not let one of their virgin daughters marry a Benjamite. So we come to the tribal plan set forth by the elders. It was a plan to furnish 200 virgins for the Benjamites who had never been married or who had lost their wives in the ambush. Verse 19. So they said, Behold, there is a feast of the Lord from year to year in Shiloh which is on the north side of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south side of Lebanon. And they commanded the sons of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and watch. And behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to take part in the dances, then you shall come out 
of the vineyards, and each of you shall catch his wife from the daughters of Shiloh and go to the land of Benjamin. It shall come about when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us that we shall say to them, Give them to us voluntarily, because we did not take for each man of Benjamin a wife in battle, nor did you give them to them, else you would be now be guilty. The sons of Benjamin did so, and took wives according to their number from those who danced, whom they carried away. And they went and returned to the inheritance, and rebuilt the cities, and lived in them. The sons of Israel departed from there at that time, every man to his tribe and family, and each one of them went out from there to his inheritance. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So here's we've got a dilemma that we're facing the Israelites. The vow had been made that none of their daughters would be given to the Benjamite wives. Where would they get them? if they would not give them from their families. The women cannot be given from these Jewish families. Therefore, at Shiloh, the virgin daughters of Shiloh would come to take part in these dances. But, but, Shiloh was not a town as such. Well, if the writer tells us that this was a Canaanite area, there must have been Canaanites there also with those Israelites girls who would come out. They were not all Jews. And if Canaanite women came from the outskirts of the tabernacle complex to dance in the fields to the music, it seems possible that the Israelites hit on a workable solution. 